So uh, yeah, hey everyone, um, welcome to CKAMAs. Uh, today's guest has a track record for calling her shot and seeing it all the way through. At a very young age, she set out to perform on Broadway professionally and did exactly that. Eventually performing in some of the most prolific musicals to date, including Hairspray and Grease, and working alongside some of the industry's highest caliber talent, including an SNL alum and a Tony Award nominee, but to name a few. But on her way to the summit, she realized that she would wanted to have an impact beyond the stage and set out to become a software engineer. Making very little money as an actress, she decided to jump off the career path she spent her whole life working towards and set out to save up enough money to attend a boot camp. Help me in welcoming a woman that embodies hard work, perseverance, tenacity, and really setting that tunnel vision to make your dreams come true. This is Carly Robinson, and she is a software engineer at Slack. Hi, Carly. Pleasure. Hi. Hello. Thank you for, Carly. Yeah, thank you for coming, uh, Carly. Thank you uh, for really that really incredible you. introduction. I that was so so well written and spoken, and I uh, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, so actually, listening to your story. By the way, for the people that are on this call right now, um, if you haven't yet, please, please, please go into the Breaking into Startups podcast and look up Carly Robinson. Her story is just one, like I just mentioned a very impactful and inspirational story. And when I heard it, I was just like, this is incredible that she's um, volunteered her time to go ahead and speak to us. And actually, I, I did want to uh, bring up, so um, one of the, the ways that you actually ended up getting into like a boot camp was actually through the help of a friend. Do you mind um, sharing about that and why that kind of impacts you in, in your kind of wanting to give back to others as well? Oh, for sure. Um, so yeah, my, um, so I had performed, uh, done musical theater professionally, um, mainly doing, uh, I, I did the Broadway in Chicago mainly. Um, and we, um, after doing musical theater for a couple of years after I graduated, um, I ended up, um, I ended up working, realizing that I needed to change direction. Um, I don't remember if I re if I referenced this in my um, in my podcast at the time, but you know it was um, hard times for my like in my personal life financially, and I had student loans, and I really realized that I needed to make a big significant change. And um, at that time, uh, I quit acting and I was looking for jobs in New York um, to be closer to my family because I was living in Chicago at the time. And they, um, they uh, I ended up, a friend from college was working for a foundation that worked on human trafficking that was run by uh, the former CEO of Ford Models. Um, and uh, Katie Ford, uh, so it was a, the job was to be her personal assistant and, um, I ended up working for Katie. Uh, she had like, on the spot. uh, I flew out to, um, like we, we had this zoom interview and I was super nervous because, <laughs> and she had me, uh, move out to New York within like, three weeks. So I dropped everything and flew out there and ended up um, working for her for two years and she became a mentor to me. We uh, were working very closely with her, her foundation is called Freedom for All and it works to end human trafficking. And we supported nine different organizations across the globe that were working to end slavery and rehabilitate people who have been formerly enslaved uh, or trafficked. And um, Katie knew that I, you know, I didn't come from a family with a lot of money. <laughs> like I, I was, 
Um, and I, I was saving for a, a coding boot camp while I had been working for her. Um, and she really changed my life because when it finally, being a personal assistant, there's not a lot of, of, of growth. And so she, all the people that had worked for her had kind of, she had encouraged them to, you know, like what's next? Like, and she knew that I was interested in coding and ended up sponsoring me um, to go to Hackbrite, uh, which was completely life-changing because I definitely would have ran out of money and not been able to afford it if she hadn't done that. Um, yeah. That's, that's actually incredible. And actually, so when we had originally recorded the podcast, that was about what, three years ago now? It was um, like, I think I'd been an engineer for maybe six, seven months at the time. Yeah. So <laughs> would you like sharing some of the um, learnings that you've just had over the past like recent couple of years and how that's kind of just shaped you into the engineer that you are today? Sure. Um, yeah. And I mean, I don't know if this will be helpful because like, I know you sent me some of the questions they had in the discussions. I can touch on those too. Yeah, for um, sure. You, yeah, use this time to go ahead and dive deep into um, whatever topics you feel are valuable. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I've been an engineer at Slack for four and a half years now and I started you know, kind of at the bottom, we were, uh, I, I was an associate engineer um, as my first job and Slack was very small at the time. It was probably like, it, I think I was around like employee 150 or 180 or something like that. Um, I recently learned, I thought I was in the 200s, but someone who started after me recently corrected me on that. But, um, yeah, I, I started out, I, I've, I'm now a senior engineer on the security team, um, which I recently moved over. Um, so my first two years, uh, I guess one thing I've done at Slack is I've, um, I've worked on a couple different parts of the product. Um, I've worked on, first I was on our enterprise team, which uh, was really interesting challenge because it was, um, Slack was growing so quickly at the time that we had to re-architect the back end to support the load and to support um, bigger teams that wanted to use Slack. Um, so I kind of first started learning um, from some of the best and like I got very, very lucky in terms of, I get, was getting to learn from engineers that were formerly at Facebook during a similar time or, or Google and learning about distributed systems. Um, and then um, after being on plat or en enterprise I moved to the platform team, which is our, um, is the team that maintains our APIs and, um, and our plot and supports our features related to uh, administering apps across Slack and um, uh, building different workflows. I built our, help build our, the Google Calendar app, if anybody uses that in Slack. Um, and uh, after working on platform for two years, I have recently had the opportunity to move to the security team um, where I am helping Slack uh, build secure libraries by default so that developers don't have to think about security so much um, when they're developing code. So that's kind of my high level. <laughs> um, Sunday. Yeah, that's, that's so incredible just because I know that I use Slack every single day and just the idea of having like a, a product that you're working on being touched by millions and millions and millions of users is, um, it's like huge. It's not like a, a small feat. Um, so I kind of wanted to go ahead and just open up um, a Q&A session with just the rest of the community. Um, if anyone here has any questions for Carly, do you guys mind dropping them either in the chat or going ahead and unmuting yourself, uh, asking her a question? I've uh, got one actually, because, uh, so my name's Mia. I am a full-time Kenzie student. I'm also a disabled mother of four. Um, so power to the women in tech, because I love seeing it. And power to you, Carly, for your inspiring and amazing story. I cannot wait to see where you go just 
amazing. Anyway, back to the point at hand. Um, so one of my favorite features on Slack is the fact that it has our pictures and our names uh, succinctly so we can see it all the time. And um, one of the features that I'm working on and why this is really helpful in our classroom setting is because I go to school remotely. I obviously do not live anywhere near Indianapolis because I'm over here on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of my favorite features, but logistically, how hard was it to integrate little details like that, such as like keeping the picture next to the name um, when you're looking through the directories and stuff? Like how difficult was that or was it rather easy once you started implementing it? Um, so those features of Slack, so I mean, Slack is a huge engineering organization now. Um, I actually wasn't on the team that worked on that. Like I'm, I'm a backend engineer at Slack. So a lot of the work I was doing, um, like that, I probably can't speak how hard that was. Um, but, um, I think, uh, in terms of specific features that's like the, the product development at Slack is generally, um, you know, like our, our back, our teams are comprised, uh, they're broken up into pillars. So like our core product is, you know, they own, um, it, it's mixed between front end and back end engineers, uh, QA design and product. Um, and um, every team will have some front end engineers some back end engineers, some a designer, a QA engineer, um, and usually a product manager. And uh, the, the way features are proposed generally these days are, they kind of come from the top where people, um, the product designers will, based on our users' feedback and um, on research, we they will come with different features um, and flesh those out for us. And we, the designer will do the mock-ups for how all of that, um, for how things are going to look and how people are going to interact with it. And then when it gets to the engineers, we're really talking more about um, the uh, technical implementation of it and the, 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 like how feasible it is because, you know, like Slack grew, Slack, because it, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Slack story, but it started out as a, as a game um, and, it was a pretty popular game and they ended up having to pivot um, in order to not lose funding. And um, that's what ended up being Slack. So most of Slack ended up being written within, within a four, four month sprint by four or five engineers. So when it was growing very fast, like in the early days, you know, we were, I think there were like 20 and 20 to 40 people new people every week this is like during 2015 um and so we all were going into this code base where a lot of things were untested um there was you know there were also a lot of features that we were tasked with building so it was very um it was we had to constantly be um Re we did a lot of reorganizing to make sure that we were working in the most efficient way. Um, and um, that has continued to develop over time. I don't know how, how useful that is <laughs> specifically to people in this, um, in this channel, but let me know. <laughs> you know. That's like super useful because I wasn't even, um, so my major, I guess, is UX design. And so I'm learning and have been learning for years front end engineering, but also the design concepts. Um, and so sometimes I feel like we get a little disconnected from the software engineers because we look at the design concepts and we're like, oh, that's engineering, but it's front end engineering. So um, I really appreciate the thoroughness of your answer and kind of explaining a little bit more about why it wasn't something that you were necessarily familiar with, because that in and of itself gave me a lot of insight into how your teams work and how Slack works which almost makes it more user-friendly for me. And I have to use it every single day. Like I literally have six messages right now that I have to go look at when we're done here. Yeah. But it, I mean, it's just been such a useful resource that, that 
I could ask you questions all day long about it, honestly, but thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Melvin, question for you. Yeah. Um, so I kind of, the, the questions you sent me or beforehand, I grouped them into sort of themes. Like it seems like there were a couple of themes in the questions. It was like, um, yeah, for you sure. know, questions about career changing and the challenges of career changing from a non-traditional background. There are a bunch of questions about learning to code, like how do you stay motivated? Um, like learning strategy, like how like strategies for learning. Um, and then there are a bunch of questions about, you know, transitioning from a boot camp to a first job. So like, what was the job hunt like? And what are the first job expectations? And then, you know, like how long, like growing as an engineer over time. Um, so I, I mean, if that works, like I can just kind of like work through that. And if people want to chime in with other questions, we can. I think, I think this, that's actually perfect. Um, so each of these um, AMAs are actually experiments in the running so the more okay. that we kind of format these like as we go like the better so i'm actually thank you so much for like um preparing like to that extent that's actually super helpful um for our next <laughs> one so yeah for sure so a lot of the um, members on this channel are essentially like in that transition of either um you know they're they're beginners or they're in a boot camp right now and their immediate goal is to just learn how to code and then beyond that, like transitioning into like that tech role. So if you could hit um, just some of the important, you know, universals of just transitioning and, and learning and kind of motivating yourself and just having that like tenacity and that tunnel vision that you were able to implement in your own life and kind of just see things through. I think that a lot of the members in this, in this chat right now uh, would greatly benefit from that. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I see there's also some some questions that came in a little bit. I, uh, I guess one question I saw was what advice you would have to someone who has a degree in computer science but has zero experience. Um, I mean, I think that kind of ties into some of the questions people had around like, um, you know, what's the threshold? Someone asked like, what's the threshold of knowledge or codes, coding skills that are necessary to break into your first tech job from another career path? Um, I think that, I think that being able to understand just web, basic web application architecture, you know, how, how does the, like the, the basics of, you know, how do HTTP requests work? Like, how does that interact? What is web server? Knowing how the piece, the front end and the back end of a small web application fit together. Um, being able to understand what an API is, what a, like, how to design um, database tables. And um, I think a lot of boot camps these days are like, are preparing you for that first job. Like I felt, I, I went to Hackbright and I felt very prepared for my first job. Um, when I got to Slack, you know, the biggest challenge when I first, when I started was, was kind of getting used to the development environment and getting used to the different tools and what it's like to like, how do you search for things in a, in a giant code base? Um, so getting a, a, a use, uh, learning how to do things like grep for code, um, using keywords and learning how to use your, like the shortcuts in your um, whatever software editor you're using. Um, that was really helpful. I think another thing that was, um, I mean, I, a lot of, it, I think things have changed over the last couple of years um, around interviews. Uh, a lot of software companies are still doing whiteboarding interviews, um, which, so I think the more you can get together with people after you graduate your boot camp and practice whiteboarding, practice um, data structures and solving problems with data structures, the better you will be um, when you get in. 
to actually write code. Um, I think that a lot, but I, but I also think that once, once you get your job, your job is to learn, you know, like I, I think one thing that really helped me, um, like some of the other questions that came in were like, um, you know, what did I use to study and what tools did I help to understand coding? Um, and then someone asked, you know, is building a project a good way to learn? Have you ever done a function spec or outline? Um, I think I'll say I'm kind of jumping around here, but um, in terms of what the best way to learn is before you're going to a boot camp. Um, I know for me, because I was not a, I came from an untraditional background. Um, the way I saw the boot camp was, it was an opportunity for me to sink in. And I wanted, I didn't want it to be like the first time I was, I was reading or learning how to code. Cause I just was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to actually learn something in three months or like, so I had done a lot of self-study before I went to the boot camp, and things I used were um, Code Academy online, Treehouse, um, and uh, I did, you know, Skillshare, I did Udemy classes, I did Learn Python the hard way, um, and kind of just tried to get a sense of what the fundamentals were, um, and used the boot camp as an opportunity to solidify that knowledge and learn it in a deeper way. And I think, does anyone have a question? I think that, no, I think, oh, sorry, that might sorry. be a little background. So actually that, that whole notion of like, um, sorry, are you saying? Uh, so the whole notion of like m mastering those fundamentals and really like trying to grasp your brain around that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you have to say about, because um, I know that you've mentioned kind of having parallels between like that and, and performing arts or like ballet, right? Like how important is it to really just get those fundamentals? And some people seem to like try to trip themselves up by looking farther ahead. What, what do you, what kind of advice do you have for, for those people? Um, so one thing I would say a lot, like when, well, when I was, First, learning how to code, you know, a lot of the boot camp applications would ask for, you know, tell me about a time you described, like you did something technical. Um, and I really had no technical experience at the time except for ballet. And I, people don't really look at ballet and immediately think like technique, but um, I think what, what you're referring to is, is one insight that I had was like, I mean, coding, I had read a blog post about, um, I think it was from Flatiron School, and sorry, this is like so long, so many years ago, I'm like jogging my memory, but like, I, I remember, um, I read this blog post, I think it was Flatiron School, about how coding and programming is a craft. And that really resonated with me because I always thought about, um, as I grew up as a dancer, you know, ballet was a craft and it was a tech and technique that you built over time. Um, and one thing I always would find in ballet was that I could, you're only as good as your basics, you know, like you're, when you're young, and you are learning technique for the first time, that is, that becomes your foundation. And, you know, a dancer's alignment is so, like if you develop muscles in the wrong way, it's gonna, your body overcompensates and it's, it's hard to get, you know, like everything falls out of whack. And I remember wishing that I had, really paid more to more attention um, uh, to the fundamentals of like how things should be at um, when learning technique because that's what you use over and over again um, and so what I had focused on with 
coding when I was first learning was just making sure I understood the fundamentals like the back of my hand. So I had done, you know, I think I did the, the Code Academy courses. I redid them like three, two to three times each just because I wanted to make sure that I fully understood it. And, you know, I would, I just tried not to let myself get, I, I, I gave myself permission that I wish that I had given myself, you know, when I was learning ballet or like even certain things in, in grade school where like that foundational knowledge can really limit how you excel later. And I think that by taking that time to really, really understand like what is a variable, what is, what's happening on a for loop, like how are these, um, you know, what are these fundamental, like how are these data structures, uh, these patterns em emerging across different languages and what does that mean? Um, really like taking my time with that stuff really paid off um, it, as, as, I, as I went on. No, that's, I think that's actually very valid with all sorts of crafts, right? Like I, I love the way that you were able to just parallel those so well. Um, so something that maybe not everyone that has listened to your story yet doesn't realize, but you actually didn't get into hack right your first time, right? That's right. Yeah, no, it, um, the first time I applied, I didn't get in. And I was, you know, I had done all of the Code Academy classes like a couple times, but I had never built anything at that point. Um, so I, I really had nothing to, to really prove that, you know, like I, like I kind of took it as like, okay, yeah, like I didn't get in, but who could blame them because I, you know, I don't have a technical background at all. I think I had written my, my essay about, you know, the most technical thing I had done was, was how you execute a turn as a ballet dancer and how detail oriented that is. But, um, and I, it was kind of crazy because I had, I got rejected from Hackbright, but on that same a part-time coding boot camp in New York that was through Code Academy, which Code Academy was doing a pilot where um, they were piloting in-person uh, part-time boot camps. And um, I ended up getting accepted into that Hackbright. And the Code Academy boot camp was really, it was pretty intensive. It was probably like 30 hours a week on top of my full-time job. It was all day on Saturday, but it was all project-based. Um, so by the end of the, and I, and I, I also started writing a blog because I was like, okay, I need to build a case for myself um, to prove to people that I can do this. Because, you know, like there was, and there was a part of me that was like, I, I don't like, I'd, I'd never really built anything other than doing these couple little online gaming, like gamified coding exercises. And, uh, but once I did actually started building some projects, um, I started gaining more confidence that it was something I really enjoyed um, and that I could be good at. And I had, I had proof, I had something to be able to be like, yes, I don't have a technical background, but here's this thing that I built. And um, I decided to apply to Hackbright again. And I did, and the second time I got in, because I had, and, and it also really helped me because the fact that I had done that, I went through Hackbright having already done a part-time coding boot camp, and, and that coding boot camp also was, was more front-end focused. Um, so by the time I graduated Hackbright, I had, more, I was more proficient in, in other coding languages than the other students were. And I also had experience doing front end um, when Packwright was more back end focused. And I think it really helped me just, you know, 
get a job faster after after graduating. So it ended up being a blessing in disguise. So does anyone else here in, in the chat currently that is on uh, with us right now have any questions for Carly? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. It'd be helpful to also show a little video so that um, Carly can attach a, a name to the face. But yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question if it's all right. <laughs> Hi, uh, Carly, thanks so much for, um, for your inspirational story and, and sharing all that. Um, I mentioned in the chat, I'm doing uh, Flatiron's um, software engineering program now, oh, and awesome. it's all in, or so far, it's all focused in Ruby. So I was just kind of curious, mm -hmm. like going into this as, you know, someone completely new to the field. Um, I like have a little bit of background in Python and Java, but nothing, you know, nothing really deep. I was just kind of curious, like, do you feel like I should be supplementing that with other languages? Like, not that I have time to do that, but um, yeah, no. like, I, how, I, and then how does that work when you're applying for jobs? Do you kind of, are you kind of limited to like companies that use that language or, or how does that work? That's a great question. Um, so I would say you don't, it doesn't matter. Like you should focus on, like, I think learning Ruby and learning just for now, focusing on Ruby and understanding some of the nuance of that language and, you know, because I, I think all that matters when you get out into um, the interview phase uh, and you're starting to apply and, and, and do whiteboarding problems, like you just want to know the language well enough so, so that you don't have to, you don't have to think about it as, like, it, it helps to have know a language uh, like the features of a language well when you are whiteboarding. Um, and it, it gives you the opportunity to demonstrate, you know, deep, uh, to, to like the, the way that you, the, the data structures that you use to solve a problem during a whiteboarding interview are an opportunity to show your knowledge of, you know, how deep you know a specific language. And the thing is, it doesn't, and, and to answer your question about, you know, does that, does learning Ruby mean you can only apply to jobs that use Ruby? No, definitely not. A lot of companies don't care. Like there are, like, I didn't know, um, like when I, when I had uh, applied to Slack, we had done, I knew, I did my interview in Python and they don't use Python at Slack. They use HP and hack and like things I'd never written before. And it, it doesn't really matter. Like I, I, there, the more you coding languages you learn, the more you realize like a lot of them are very similar. Um, they they use the similar, similar data structures. There's, there's really just slight differences in syntax. And it, once you know one, it becomes pretty easy to pick up another one. And a lot of times, like, you know, they're, most people who start working at Slack haven't written PHP and most of them ha definitely haven't written Hack because the only companies that have ever used Hack are Facebook. <laughs> it's like face, it's like the only people that use that language are Facebook and Slack. Um, so I think it's just focus on the one language, focus, focus on learning Ruby and don't worry about, you know, I think you should apply to jobs that you feel excited about, um, apply to job that, you know, where the company culture really like feels like somewhere that you belong and that you, you know, they, that whatever company you're applying to like has values that you share. Um, Cause I think really for, for what a lot of people are looking for in entry level, um, especially if they're hiring boot camp grads is they're looking for people who are hungry to learn. They're looking for people who are curious. They're looking for people who, you know, and, and I think having a background that is um, untraditional is actually an asset, especially if you have work experience, because a lot of these, you know, if you have work experience and then you taught yourself how to code, you're going to be able to add a lot of value um, to whatever team you're working on in, in that, you know, you just know how to be a professional already. And I think that as long as you, and they know that, 
you're probably they're get, they're going to have to train you in the specifics of whatever their code base is because every code base is a little different. Um, so I think you know by being excited about the company you're applying to um, and being able to demonstrate you know your curiosity, your hunger, your excitement, your passion for what you're doing um, will go a really long way. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Good, Super and, helpful. Thank good you. luck. Good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, everybody, let's bring on some more questions. <laughs> I have a question. So um, you said you did self based boot camp, Carly. Sorry. How you said you did self based, like like self paced. I mean, sorry. <laughs> you did a self paced boot camp. Um, sorry, I, I, um, so I did a boot camp um, through Code Academy before I went to Hackbrite. Um, and then I did a lot of self teaching before I applied to boot camps. Okay, and when you did the actual boot camp, was it self paced or you had like a set goal? So once I was in the actual boot camp, it was, there was a, um, it was a full, so Hackbrite's a full time. Uh, coding bootcamp for women um, in San Francisco. And uh, it's a full-time program. So it's like, it's three months long and classes are 10 to 6 p.m. five days a week. Um, oh, wow. And then um, at the end, like the, the first half of the bootcamp, you're just like in class all day and you're doing labs and you're doing homework. Um, and then the second half, they write, you have a project that you spend most of your time on where you're building your own web application from scratch. So you write the front end, you write the back end, uh, design the database and, um, and it's something like some people will deploy it to Heroku. So you can get, you get to kind of show um, that your knowledge of how everything fits together, how you, and um, you know, we, uh, whatever app you decide to build, um, becomes part of your portfolio. Did you work while you were like doing the bootcamp? So um, I did not, which is what made it, cause it's a full time, you can't really work when you're- I was gonna say that doesn't seem very- <laughs> Yeah, it's basically like going to school full time, um, which they do have a part time program now, at, like back in 2015, they didn't. So I know there's actually a girl at Slack that is going through the part time boot camp. So she works and, and just goes at night. Um, and and I, I, was, I was considering the part time one, but then I'm like, I don't know if I'll stay motivated if I'm just doing it at my pace, I guess, like self paced. I don't know. I, I need like pressure. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, I think a couple people asked about like, how do you stay motivated when you're teaching yourself? And I mean, if I'm being like, it, it's not easy. Like I, I definitely, when I first was teaching myself, like what I think I, the first time I dabbled with Code Academy, I was still doing acting and I was living in Chicago and I was auditioning and I would start, I, I think I started the Ruby course like and got halfway through and then, you know, put it down and came back a couple months later and restarted it. Um, and I think, really it, it becomes like you have to have some self-discipline and like For figure sure. out like how um I, I think that by signing up for a class where I had to be there in person that really helped accelerate um my learning get me some stronger like the the fact that the um the Code Academy class, uh, part time boot camp I went to was, um, you know, half online, but we had Saturdays, which were five hours in a classroom. And I think that just helped having that face to face and, and having homework um, gave me accountability. Um, and I think, in terms of motivation, it, it really something that helped me stay focused was just kind of like eye on the prize, knowing the fact that once I get through this, I'm gonna have a skill set that is incredibly marketable. I'm gonna be, I'm going to be 
uh, I'll have a skill set that I can do from anywhere um, that, you know, worst case, like at the, I had no idea if anyone would hire me. Um, I, but I didn't really care that much. I was kind of just like, you know what, I'm getting this skill set that pays, I know I can make money with, I can pay it, I can, I can freelance, I can build worst case scenario if no one, if no one, um, if I don't get hired by a big company, I can start my own company. Um, and knowing the stability that was at the end of the tunnel, because there's a lot of things you can do where you work really, really hard and there's no payoff, like acting. <laughs> and, and um, you know, like I was used to putting in long hours. I was used to, you know, making sacrifices um, for that lifestyle. And I remember thinking to myself like, okay, if I could apply that mindset to learning how to code, like chances are I'm going to be at least there's a, there's a higher, way higher likelihood of me being successful than there is for like acting <laughs> and, um, or like becoming like a, a big star in acting. And I was kind of like, it makes, I don't know. Um, I, I, I think that really focusing on why you're doing it. And, and for me, I think it was also personal because like I had, you know, like my family was having financial problems. I had a, a ton of student loans. I had, you know, like my dad's an alcoholic and like couldn't hold a steady job and was, you know, my mom couldn't get a job either at the time. And I had gone to, I knew that I was younger and I was able to, I was more in a position than anyone else in my family to actually make a significant change um, and, and make money. And in the fact that, you know, I, I actually at the time had a lot of instability in my life. Um, and coding gave me something that was stable and logical. And I found sanctuary in that. Um, and I think that you, the strength of your why really makes a big difference in how far you go in your success. You know, like if you, for me, I think a big reason why I was able to get past the roadblocks and pick it up again was because I had such a strong, like, you know, I was willing to put, to suffer in the short term, knowing that my investment would give me a skill where I could take care of my family if I needed to. And I, I think that it, I mean, it was, it was the best investment I've ever made. That's awesome. Yeah, that is super, like incredibly powerful. Now, I've noticed that with that parallel of like, you, you're, you're a storyteller, right? Like that's what the arts are. That's the people that you kind of um, grew up with or that you looked up to as you were um, preparing with your ballet and just dancing and, and all of these wonderful things that you wanted to accomplish. I'm wondering how much of that storytelling aspect uh, was involved in like the job search or with, you know, getting to know people at Slack. Um, could you share a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I think I definitely, I think one thing that I did with the project that I worked on, my right project was about the theme of it was it was a I call I called it like the LinkedIn meets uh what was it rap genius for actors and it was this database where you could search for scripts and um annotate them like you can on rap genius but also you I used the YouTube API so that people could upload, like create, I, I made the ability for people to create profiles. I used all of my friends who were actors. I used all their headshots to like create fake profiles. And then you could um, upload 
videos of yourself performing a monologue. Um, and by doing a project or like building a web application that was thematic to my background, it gave me a tool to both, um, that was strategic because I, I was able to talk about my background and then also weave in, you know, what I've learned, my, my technical abilities. Um, and I kind of, by, by being able to, you know, at the, at the time, I think it, it's, it's funny, like I, I've been an engineer for four and a half years now and it's like, at the, I, there's so much I, I now just take for granted. And, but when I was first becoming an engineer and like really learning, I was, I was so sh shocked at some of the parallels um, between, you know, the experience I would get when coding felt very similar to the experience I would get when I would be an adult at a dance audition. And the dance company maybe like twice and we'd be expected to perform it like it, it was a actual performance and that was how we got a job and but the way I always really liked having to learn things fast like that because it was pattern matching it was which is ultimately what coding is it's it's pattern matching um and it's I, I think that being able to talk about those um, it definitely helped to be able to show people that were already working in tech that there are there are similarities in fields that they might not expect, um, and and the transferable skills are um, there are transferable skills for different backgrounds that are actually really useful, um, and I think for a lot of you know everybody has a different. A, a different story and, a, and a, a unique background when they're when they're transitioning into tech. So my advice to you know everyone listening is, you know, what does that look like for you? Like what what how can you show and tell when you're in your interviews, uh, like highlight ways that you were detail oriented in your past job and you know. That might look like talking about how ballet technique is, you know, uh, can come down to like how your hand is, you know, like you could get cut. Like I remember being at audition and someone was like, yeah, if I show the hand like this and you're going like this, we're gonna cut you. Like that's a very intense detail. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of different um systems at play um and i think i realized that i had been using the same um modes of thinking in my previous job um that i had no idea were going to be useful as an engineer yeah sorry i think cool. yeah. no rambling <laughs> no, no, no. This, this is great. Um, so I also think that you have an especially valuable and unique perspective from being in a startup and watching it grow. But before I ask my question, does anyone else here have um, a, a final question or um, other things that they would like to ask Carly? Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, what it's like being a female in tech. And um, how has it been a strength and how has it been like a negative? If you could just touch on that a little bit. For sure. Thanks. Thank, thanks for the question. Um, I mean, I think that I got very lucky at Slack because when we were smaller, the, they valued diversity. Um, they, Slack has, I think we're like 30% female engineers. And so, and I, you know, out of five different managers I've had over my tenure, maybe six, like more than half of them have been women. Um, so I'm, I feel really lucky at Slack because 
I don't really have to think about, um, I haven't really had to think about my gender. Um, and I think for women, that is something to consider when you're choosing a company, like, because that's definitely the exception to the rule. Um, that being said, I have experienced, like, it's also depends on the people. Like I've, I've experienced, um, like there was one guy who, like I had one manager um, earlier on where, you know, my team, my sub team was, um, we were all women, we were all female engineers, like my, which is like kind of unheard of. Um, but then we got this, this one uh, manager who was a, he was a new manager and he, let's just say within six months, um, all of us left his team and he eventually was fired um, because a female intern reported him for uh, discrimination. And it was interesting because at the time being discriminated for my gender, like totally didn't even occur to me as like something he was doing actively. Like I thought he was just micromanaging me because he was, you know, not used to being, he was used to being the, he was recently promoted from being an engineer. So I was thinking like, you know, maybe he's just, he's, he's trying to micromanage our decisions because he hasn't quite figured out like how to empower the engineers that you're meant. And, but the one thing that was interesting was that like there was one, uh, our one intern was a guy and he didn't like, he was the only person that wasn't getting micromanaged. And um, the, and over time, um, I think like a year after I had, I had already left the team, I was like, his team was like all white men. And, and some of them even left the company because they were frustrated by him. And, but like, that was, that was around the time we had that female intern who was like, she went to HR and was like, yeah, I'm being treated differently. And I think it was a little easier for her to see because at that time she was the only woman. Um, and I think, so I, I think what it can, the, the, to sum that up, that's like the experience of being a, a female engineer is sometimes that you don't realize you're being discriminated against. Like sometimes you're, it, it happens in subtle ways. Um, but I think that it really, like I, I feel like at Slack at least, um, they really value diversity and I have not had to worry about my gender very much, which is great. I mean, now I'm working on, I'm, I just switched to the security team and I'm the only woman. Um, I'm trying just not to think about it so far. Like I think, and, and I feel like a big part of not really having to worry about it has to do with the culture of the company. So, and it, I mean, part of the reason I have stayed is because of that. I think I'm, I'm generally kind of worried about going to another company and having to deal with, you know, changing who I am because of, or like not being respected because of um, being a woman. I, I do think you definitely have to prove yourself a little bit more. Like I, I, as I'm, kind of thinking about it, I definitely am proactive about, you don't, you, like people don't always give you the benefit of the doubt that you're smart, you know, or that you're competent. And I, I think I found that when I, also when I was promoted, I was promoted to senior. And I thought like, oh, like once I'm a senior engineer, I'll be, I won't have to prove myself anymore because it'll just be like, I, you know, I have the title. But like it was interesting because I had been promoted and then I switched teams and got a new manager and I felt like I was really frustrated for a while because I, I felt like I had to, to, I was starting from scratch. Like she was not trusting me with the, you know, I, my previous manager had trusted me to like write the tech spec and, and take leadership. And my new manager was kind of treating me like I was much more junior and she had the more of like, like just a, a different style. And it, it took me a while to like, I 
figure out like how do I prove my, my competence here? And it, it, I mean, I, I try not to get discouraged by it because I there's not much you can do, but um, I think as a female engineer, like the culture makes a big difference. So what's something that you like about being a, a female engineer in tech? You, um, I mean, not to say, I think I really appreciate you being so open and generous with talking about the difficulties, but um, I just kind of wanted to, I think, I. so I'll just share with you. I feel like as a woman in tech, we bring a different perspective and there's so much more like we can build because of the diverse aspect and uh, the idea of having uh, a, a unique perspective that's not in tech right now. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many like opportunities. I, I, and so um, that's just like how I, yeah, I mean, I think I don't have the experience either of being in the mix of it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's so true. Like, I, I think that, you know, emotional intelligence is something that women are socialized to have, like, a lot of, and sometimes in tech, that is emotional intelligence and, um, you know, being able to communicate in an empathetic way is not always valued. Um, and I think that's something that I feel like I'm able to, to bring um, for sure. I, I think I do, it is a really nice, um, I feel like very, I, the community of women in tech is very tightly knit and, and is very supportive. I think that is something I, I really appreciate. Um, just, you know, the people you get access to when and can relate to when um, you're a woman in tech, there's so few of us. It's, I, there's just, there's a lot of opportunity to actually like get mentored and, and connected and, and people are really excited to, to help bring, build each other up and give each other opportunities and, um, I, I think it's it's a it's my that's definitely my favorite part about it is just the community of people. Thank you so much. You hit on so many different points that like we're just right where I'm at and just it very encouraging too. And just along with my philosophy about learning and stuff and so I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Of course. Thank you for your question and best of luck with everything. So it's looking like we're um, unfortunately running out of time. Uh, Carly, I want to be super respectful of your own schedule and everything. Uh, would you have time for like one final question or do you need to head out? Yeah, totally. I, I, I don't have anywhere to be, so <laughs> whatever right. you guys want. Cool. So one, one aspect, like I mentioned before, that I, I thought would be super useful and valuable for the people that are on this call right now are you actually joined a company, um, a startup, and watched it grow over the years. Can you kind of share a little bit about like what that experience kind of looks like? Yeah, um, it's, it was wild. It was a, a, when I first joined Slack, um, I think the company was like around 150 people. Now we are over 2000 people. Wow. Um, and that all happened in a very short amount of time. Um, and I think that, you know, there were every, every couple months, it felt like a new company. It was like, you know, and, and it was true. Cause like a, a 150 person company, the process is then, what ways you communicate and share information, the ways people interact are going to be different from a 500 person company. And when you go from being a hundred first, a hundred person com or 150 company to a 500 person company in the span of four months, it's like, there's a lot of organizational, just like 
as soon as you're comfortable with one process, it's got to change. <laughs> and I think that Slack did, um, we were lucky in the fact that like our, the founders are older. They've all done startups before. Like they, they had, um, the Slack founders were, had also built Flickr. Um, so they, and they have a really strong network in the, in, um, the Valley. So, you know, we had a lot of people who, you know, worked or, or a lot of our execs uh, felt like how they had done this before and we're, and we're doing it, I mean, it's deciding our processes in a very deliberate way. Um, there was even a point where we were going so fast and, and we, and Stuart sort of like, was like, all right, we're going to pause hiring for, not because we can't grow, but we want to be intentional about not losing our culture and making sure that like, um, we, people are able to kind of settle in and on and make sure that we are, have processes in place so that we can all be aligned. Um, and what that looked like in practice was like, you know, from an engineering perspective, it used to be a little more intimate, like all the engineers would be in one channel, you know, or like, a, like maybe like 10 channels. And now, um, and we had three main engineering groups. It was like core product and enterprise and platform. Now there are set like, and there are like maybe 70 engineers. Um, now there's 700 engineers. There's so many different teams, like even just within platform, there's like five sub teams and it kind of, in some ways, like everyone's has, uh, your domain knowledge is way more specific. Um, and it feels a little more siloed. Like I have no, I used to know all the engineers. Now I really only know the people that are on my team. Um, and it's kind of the culture uh, when you get to become a bigger company, you really have to maintain that on your team. Like I think the, when you get to be a bigger company, people's happiness really depend on how good their manager is and how, you know, um, like how good that manager is at, at building team trust and camaraderie and, and making sure that people are getting the opportunities and the challenges they're excited about. Um, and there's just like, there's always growing pains. Like I, I think there are a lot of growing pains that happen that are specific to, um, you know, hyper growth startups, um, that, you know, just, ha just happen and you, you adjust to them, you know, and, and in part of that, like, I, I'm trying to think of a concrete example of that at Slack, but like, from a technical standpoint, you know, we were, we were moving so quickly that, you know, things weren't always tested. We had to like add tests and like Slack used to go down all the time. Like we used to be, it used to be kind of this joke in the beginning of just like, we'd all be working and it'd be like, Oh, Slack down for you. Yep. Slack down for you. Yep. All right. Let's go. Like, <laughs> and like, uh, Actually, that got less and less and less. Now it's like, I don't remember the last time Slack went down. Um, and those are all uh, like us becoming more mature as an engineering organization in terms of like, we don't ship project, projects without adequate tests and adequate monitoring. And, you know, there's and like a security review and um all of these other things that like are hard to get in place when you're growing so, so quick. So I guess to sum up, it was a really exciting experience. Um, I, like every day is like, I get to work at the biggest company I've ever worked at, which changes every day. <laughs> um, and I think that um, prioritization is really important and um, being able to adapt um, when things stop working. And a lot of times the way you, you realize things aren't working anymore is something breaks or something happens. And 
it's it's a little bit reactive sometimes too um but but uh I don't know. It's 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 also oh the other thing I would say is is exciting about it is that it definitely I think helped accelerate my career too because when we were a lot smaller there was a lot more opportunity to take on projects that were important and we didn't have enough engineers to do all the work um, so like I got to design you know I like I have us from when I was an associate engineer I got a software patent for a a uh, feature that I wrote and designed myself, which today, like we have so many more engineers that like that would never happen. Like, like if there's a, a like we will give that to a staff engineer with like 10 years of experience, hands down. Like it's actually a lot hard and like it's, it, it is good thing because you grow fast like the, the way you grow fast is you take on a ton of responsibility and you swim and you feel like you're swimming and then you figure it out and and then you have this proof of like yeah i can i can i can build design a piece of software like and whereas like when a company gets bigger it is you have it's harder to make a case for yourself to for someone to give you responsibility like and and it could just can take a slower time. Um, yeah, I think I think all of those are incredible takeaways because essentially, like you're kind of expanding beyond your role, and within a startup, it's kind of forced upon you. But in larger companies, you can kind of just fabric or engineer that yourself and really seek in ways like how can I contribute more and and grow as an engineer. Um, Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, before we close out, I wanted to ask, uh, where can people find you? Um, sure. So I, um, I have a Twitter. I don't tweet a ton, but feel free to tweet at me or DM me. I, Carly has red hair. Um, I also, if people have, want to email me, I'm um, carly at carly.codes is my email. Um, and yeah, feel free to ask me questions. I will totally try to get back to you. I'm terrible at responding to LinkedIn, um, but I, I always get it back eventually. It just might take me a couple months, but if you send me an email, I will, I will send or, or, you know, Twitter, whatever, like I'm happy to, I will do my best <laughs> to answer your questions. Can you, would you put your contact info in the chat, please? Uh, sure. Somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make sure that I'll, capture that and, and post it on on discussions itself um speaking of discussions this is a, a going to be a question for carly this is to close it off what is and and the idea of this is for people to execute on this and be able to share about their experiences um, in this upcoming week um, within our discussions forum so what is one thing people can do this week to get them closer to their goal of breaking into tech um, I mean, it really depends on what, where, what stage you're at, but I mean, one thing you can do if you're a beginner is like, I don't know, do a, do a code academy course. It doesn't take that long. Just like do a course, teach yourself something, um, like read everything you can on the internet and like how it works. Um, like just absorb everything you can be constantly learning and ingesting that will get you farther. Um, another thing I think that is helpful that you could do today is document your journey, like start a blog. I think that really helped me. Honestly, I, that was another thing. Like I had this blog, which is, I haven't updated it in years, which I've been meaning to, um, update it's called carlyhasredhair.com and it was my my tagline was this journey of a girl oats <laughs> and i i i think it helped me build a case for um why i why i was transitioning into tech why i wanted to um i could it gave me a, a platform to write about concepts i was learning about or you know projects i was working on or meetups i went to and 
um, it just helped build my case for like why why I was going to be a good software engineer and why people should give me a chance. And I think the more you can, and it also enabled me to have some accountability too, because it was like accountability to myself of like, all right, I'm going to put, make this blog post and, 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 and publicize it. And, and it helped me just stay on track and, and, um, and chronic and also just like solidify what I was learning. Um, so yeah, I think that's I amazing. think I think everything that you just mentioned is perfect reason for everyone that's on this um, chat tonight to use these discussions like the the forum that we've created within the app as kind of like your testing grounds, right? We have an incredible and, and Carly, you can sign up and, and jump into the discussions as well to like maybe answer questions for the upcoming week. Um, but there, there's a, a discussion forum that I'm actually super excited about, and it's called Add a Chapter. And the, the premise of it is I started off by saying, like, my mother's life story is the greatest book that I've ever read. And by taking her, like, experiences and how they've shaped me just as my identity, the, the way that I carry myself and the aspirations that I have for myself. And this, by the way, this is just talking about her, like, I haven't yet even begun to tell my own story, which I plan on doing for sure. But going through the process of like telling your story or deciphering someone else's story and seeing how that uh, applies into your own life and actually finding a way to like communicate that, like by writing things down, you have to take your thoughts and you have to make them concrete. And the more and more that you do these, the, the repetitive like muscle memory that you get from it is you, you craft an incredibly compelling story that can connect to anyone. And there are a lot of byproducts of it is like when you put your story out there, people know what you're about. They know um, how they can relate to you. They know how, how they can help you like get to where you want to go. And so I highly suggest everyone that's on this um, Zoom call to go ahead and, and post their chapters um, start that blog, like that, that muscle memory of just documenting your journey because in 5, 10, 15 years from now, you have no idea where you're going to be. And it'll be incredible to, to just read like, like this is what I was going through at this per certain period of my life. Um, and by the way, there's also a ton of resources um, following like job search or full stack development. There's a whole place for beginners. Um, there's a lot of value there, and I really would love for you guys to jump in and join the conversation. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Carly. This was incredible. Uh, ask me anything, and I think that you you killed this. So um, everyone give Carly a round of applause, please. She did such a great job. And I, I guess no one can really do anything. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure working with you guys. And everyone i'm i'm excited to go to watch those on chat on it's called on chapter or like my yeah. chapter but i'm excited to read everyone's stories because i i think another thing to add to what you said is like you know, like when i was going coding like i didn't know anyone who was who had done that transition from theater you know and i i think you don't know if you don't see your story out there, writing your story is going to to that might not know if they can do it. And by you doing it, you will, you know, help people to change their lives. And it's, it's an awesome thing. So I love you, it. Everyone. I love it. Yeah. Just, what you did right now is just a, a prime example of that. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, that concludes tonight. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Remember that this was a time investment that you all had to improve yourselves and, and listen to someone that has seen success in, that, in the industry that you want to break into. So thank you all so much again. Uh, have a good night and let's break in. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone.